Good morning. My name is George Jackson, and I will be facilitating the Sunday School lesson today. Our lesson title is Justice and the Marginalized. You're going to hear that word a lot during the lesson, marginalized. Our printed text is found in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 10 through 21. Our lesson is, again, centered on the law of Moses and its definition and explanation of them to the Israelites as they prepare to enter the promised land. He talks about the debtor, the poor, hired servant, the lender, and the borrower, and how they were to proceed with each other once they entered the promised land. Our key verse, but thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thou God redeemed thee thence. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. And that's found in Deuteronomy 24, 18. Our lesson aims are as follows. Explore God's standards for justice. Appreciate how God loves those who are poor and marginalized. And lastly, share love with those with who are rejected by others. And our theme, main theme today, are on the board. First, we're going to talk about the debtors, the disassociation, and the destitute. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for blessing and protecting all of your people throughout this week. We thank you for the good and the not so good times. We believe that you are the protector always. I pray especially that you bless me as I present this lesson, that you will guide me through each verse with clarity. I pray that you will continue to bless those who are less fortunate and their families as well. I pray and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the introduction. And we're going to call this introduction Ignorance and Want. In Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, the ghost of Christmas present presents God, Ebenezer Scrooge, on a tour of various scenes around London. Some scenes highlight holiday celebration, while others show poverty stricken individuals, including Scrooge own employee, Bob Cratchit. Toward the end of the tour, the ghost revealed two destitute children. Beneath the fold of his robe, a boy named Ignorance and a girl named Want. The ghost warned Scrooge, beware of them both, but most of all, beware this boy. Through these characters, Dickens drew his readers' attention to issues of ignorance and want. Regarding the economic challenges of his day, which was mid-19th century England, many people at that time had placed experience, that time and placed experience want and neglect, and were otherwise marginalized. Those who were better off often adopted a stance a willful ignorance toward the situation. Scrooge's next word aptly described that attitude. Cover the children ignorance and want. I do not wish to see them. Unfortunately, many still react this way, avoiding issues of economic justice by looking the other way. And we can find that in Deuteronomy 24, chapter 10. One. Lesson content. Previous lesson from this quarter focused on other aspects of God's law. His covenant with Israel, which served as a foundation for the law, and those individuals tasked with ruling on God's law. This lesson turns to the details of God's law for Israel. 
These laws make up the bulk of Deuteronomy's content and are central theme of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. The Hebrew word Torah can mean teaching or law, specifically God's law for ancient Israel. These laws depicted how the Israelites were to live rightly with each other, with their neighboring people, and with their God. Now listen to this. Today's scripture text, text comes from Moses' second address in Deuteronomy to the people of Israel, with the detailed covenant stipulation that God required for his people. Moses' address began with a detailed description of proper worship of God and continued with description of proper justice in law. Regulations regarding the handling of violent acts, issues of marriage, among other things, as God provided an ordered description of a new society. For Israel, part of being God's covenant people was the just and proper treatment of poor and otherwise marginalized individuals. Previously, Moses had reminded the Israelites that poor people would always be part of the population. As a result, Moses commanded an open-handed policy toward these individuals, requiring generous giving without resentment. Today's scripture expands on this. Now let's look into the verses. We'll call the first section Just Lending. And that's found in Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 13. Verse 10 and 11 says, When thou dost lend thou brother anything, thou shalt not go into the house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou Lynn shall bring out the pledge or brought unto thee. Our main theme, respecting the person. Now listen, this law stipulates just dealing when making loans. Moses described a situation in which a brother, a fellow Israelite, needed a loan. Elsewhere, the law forbid Israelites from charging interest on loan made to other Israelites. Question. What does a pledge refer to in this verse? It refers to collateral. Moving on. However, lenders were allowed to receive collateral or a pledge as a security for a loan. Even then, certain restrictions remain for what lenders could take as a pledge. Taking as a pledge a person's method of livelihood was forbidden, as was taking a widow's clothing. So listen to this. To maintain the borrower's dignity, the lender was not permitted to enter the borrower's house. Instead, the lender was required to stay outside the borrower's dwelling, allowing the borrower to bring out the pledge himself. In this situation, the borrower controlled what was offered as pledge with dignity and respect maintained. As an Old Testament history unfolded, the dangers of putting up security or collateral came to be recognized. And we can find that in Proverbs 17, uh, verses 18, 20. Verse 12 says, And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. Our main theme, respecting the pledge. The law added extra clarification for loan made to poor individuals. Question, why was this clarification required? Such lending stipulations were required because of extra vulnerability 
or individual may have faith. Furthermore, the law specifically prohibited lenders from charging interest on loans in these situations. Moving on, verse 13 says, In any case, thou shalt deliver him the plague again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee. And it shall be righteous, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thou God. Our main theme, respecting the plague. Additionally, lenders were limited on what could be done with a pledge or a bar of clothing, which they think rain. If that's all a poor individual could pro provide as a pledge, then the lender was prohibited from keeping it overnight. The clothing had to be returned by Sunday. Question, how did the return in the clothing benefit the borrower. This limitation protected the borrower's health during the night. Question again, why were lenders required to be gracious in their lending practice? Answer, because God is gracious. And we can find that in Psalms 116.5. Continue. The lenders act resulted in two outcomes. First, the borrower would bless the lender. So listen. One can picture the borrower preparing a good night's sleep, offering a prayer of thanksgiving to God for the lender's kindness. Second, the lender's gesture would be judged by the Lord and deemed as righteousness. Such acts were considered right standing in God's eyes and conform to the demands of God's law and covenant. God desires his people to live in this manner because his own nature is one of the righteousness, one of righteousness and justice. Lending practice as prescribed by the law serve as an example of the just and equitable action the Lord wants his people to pursue, especially for the marginalized. Verse 14 says, Thou shalt not oppress and hire servant. This is poor, that is poor and needy, whether he be of the brethren or of thy stranger that are in thy land within thy gates. Main theme, oppression of bidding. Verse 14a says this, Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy. True or false? The concern for justice among the poor and needy extended to hired hands. That's true. After that, after that experience of slavery in Egypt, Israelites were not permitted to be sold as slaves. However, an Israelite who experienced economic difficulty to the point of losing everything might serve other Israelites as a high servant or sojourner with the expectation of eventually receiving freedom. The status of such a person is sometimes known as an indentured what thing he says, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy stranger that are in thy land within thy gates. Question. Why were prescriptions to protect hired hands in Africa? Well, answer. They were going to maintain an economic livelihood, dignity, and ability of impoverished individuals, brethren or not, to continue to live among the people of God. Most requirements also extended to strangers that are in the land, foreigners, living among God's covenant people. Qualifying this with most amidst 
exception found in Leviticus 25:44. Without just treatment, these workers could become further marginalized. God's people, however, were not, were not to mistreat these individuals, even in hiring and working practices. God's people were to practice justice. The most obvious way to do so was through the timely deliverance of wages. Verse 15 says, At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it. For he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sent unto thee. 19. Opportune wages. Verse 14a says this, At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon him, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon him. Question. What is this verse saying? It's saying that workers were paid for their labor at the end of an agreed time to work. However, the hired worker who was poor was to receive their agreed upon wages at the end of each day before the sun go down. Question. What was the rationale for this procedure? This worker, this worker perhaps living a hand-to-mouth experience, depended on such timely pay to provide for daily necessities. I have a question for you. What are some church assisted programs that provide aid to local communities across America? First one is Love Incorporated. Their call center takes incoming calls from families and individuals who need help with food, rent, utilities, clothing, home and repair, etc. Then you have the Lutheran Social Services, a nonprofit charity organization that helps low-income residents and the community. They partner with the government and other organizations as a distribution center for services like food, bill assistance, and temporary housing. Catholic Char Charities. This organization has provided financial aid and many other services to the community for the past 100 years. Moving on. Verse 15b says, Let he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. If workers were treated unjustly, it would be within their power to cry out unto the Lord for help and justice. As failing to return a poor person's pledge at the end of the day would be considered unrighteous. Withholding pay from a poor person at the end of the day would be considered a sin. Centuries later, the prophet Malachi warned Israel that God will come near to you in judgment against those that oppress the hireling and his wages. God would deal decisively and swiftly with those who did not show justice to their work. Listen to this. It's called Beware of Optimism. 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 Try to say that fast. Uh, during the coronavirus pandemic of 2020, an enterprising but unscrupulous couple use the demand for hand sanitizers for their own crops. They travel to nearby homes and towns and purchase all the hand sanitizers they could find, storing up the cases of the in-demand product. They advertise their newly acquired products at vastly inflated prices. While hand sanitizer shortage was prevalent, the couple charged several times suggested retail. 
people readily purchase the hand sanitizer at the grossly inflated prices. Eventually, the government intervened and redistributed the product to those in need. During a crisis that necessitated a compassionate response, this couple exploited others for profit and caused an inequitable situation. God required his people to not take advantage of others. While many people see crisis as opportunities for personal gain, God requires fairness. What can you do to ensure that you are part of the solution rather than part of the problem? Our next section we'll call this Just Community. And verses 16, 18 cover that. Verse 16 says this. The father shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Many things commanding punishment. Question. What principle of law is described here? The principle described here stands in contrast to other law codes of the ancient world. The Babylonian law code of Hammurabi prescribed that if a builder built a house, listen to this, if a builder built a house that collapsed, causing the death of the homeowner's son, the builder's son was to be put to death. In contrast, Hebrew law required certain parameters to allow for just treatment of innocent family members who were vulnerable to harm because of the actions of a relative. The given stipulation would prevent a potentially endless chain of revenge. Listen to this. This principle does not contradict what is found elsewhere regarding God's visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. That's found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 9. While each person will surely experience the consequences of their sin, the repercussions of those sin are often experienced by others. We may think of a parent today who is justly sent to prison for a crime with side effects of their family suffering destabilization in their relationship. Moving on, verse 17 says this, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. Our main theme here is caring for the need. True or false, all Israelites were, pa were passed with looking out for the marginalized and the defenseless among them. That's true. The Hebrew word translated stranger, fatherless, and widow occur together in triads and 11 verses in the book of Deuteronomy, emphasizing God's concern for these vulnerable people. True or false, to take a widow's raiment to pledge is in the same category as asking the garment, asking the garment of a poor man, which is forbidden. Again, that's true. Furthermore, lenders who had wrongly taken such garment and pledge sometimes worsen the offense by taking those items to pagan worship. The law provided numerous reminders to God's people to uphold justice for those who needed it most. Concern for these three groups extended into the New Testament as well. God desired justice for needy individuals and his people or to desire the same. Following God's command for just living requires extra attention 
some vulnerable people. Verse 18 says this, But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thou God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. Listen. Moses reminded the second generation of Israelites of their history as slaves in the land of Egypt. That alone was God's redemptive act served as a foundation for Israel's identity. True or false, the corporate memory of that bondage and their following redemption was to motivate the Israelites to compassionate treatment of the marginalized. That's true. That would happen as the Israelites remembered their own suffering and marginalization as slaves and evil. To treat others as they had been treated by God was the watchword. They were to remember that God redeemed them from that situation and provided justice where injustice reigned. So listen to this. It's called power and memory. This man says, a young family expecting their first child recently moved in next door. One day, the young husband caught my attention and hesitantly asked, do you have a battery, battery charger that I could borrow? I said, of course. Retrieving the charger from my garage, I told him to keep it as long as he needed it. A week later, he brought back the charger and asked why I didn't hesitate lending it to him. I, had, I answered him with a story. When my wife and I were newly married and had our first son, we were living paycheck to paycheck. My car battery was dying, and I was desperate to go back and forth to work. I asked my neighbor, Harvey, if I could borrow his battery charger. He did not hesitate. I used to charge it every night. I wanted to treat you the same way Harvey treated me. That's why I did not hesitate. On hearing the story, the young man replied, that was exactly my situation. Maybe I can help my neighbor someday. Thanks. One's memory served as a powerful tool for inviting action. For the people of Israel, memory of God's redemptive act, especially from bondage in Egypt, served to remind them of how to treat others. Question, how do memories of God's work in your life shape your behavior? Just something to think about. Our last section, we call it just harvest. And that's into verses 19 to 21. Verse 19 says this, When thou cuttest down thou thine harvest in thy field, in thy field, and hast forgot a sheep in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. That the Lord thy God may bless thee and all the work of thy hand. Main theme regarding grain. Verse 19a says this When thou puttest down thou harvest in thy field, and hast forgot the sheep in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger for the fatherless, and for the widow. True or false? In addition to justice and lending practices, justice to the vulnerable was also to be seen in agrarian practice at harvest time. That's true. Often the poor 
Israelites worked in the fields during the annual harvest time. The work of harvesting was completed with a hand sickle, cutting bundles of grains and binding each into a sheaf. Written in terms of what the land order has forgotten should have encouraged the underprivileged to boldness in retrieving the grain accidentally left behind. That should, that should have been no worry that the land owner would later demand it back. So listen to this. The law made clear that the corner of the field be left unharvested and only a single harvest occur so that the poor and the stranger might harvest from the field of their own suffering. This legislation is seen enacted in the narrative of Ruth. A foreign widow who gleaned the leftover grain from the field of her, of her Hebrew relative Boaz. Verse 19b says, That the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand. The phrase, That the Lord thy God may bless thee, occur three times in the book of Deuteronomy. Here, and in chapter 14, 29, and chapter 23, 20. In all three cases, God's blessing is continued on meeting the needs of others. The Lord will bless those who honor his laws and treat the marginalized with respect and compassion. Verses 20 to 21 says, when thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bow again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. The main thing here is regarding produce. Grapes and olive crops were often planted together using a method called polyculture, the practice of growing several crops side by side, which was made popular in the Mediterranean region. Each crop contributed to the health and well-being of the other. Harvesting olives required that a harvester beat the boughs of an olive tree with a long stick. Most ripe olives would fall to the ground, and any olive remaining on the branches were to be left for the stranger, for the fathers, and the widow. The same generous harvesting principle was applied to the gathering of grapes. What remained Following the first harvest was to be left for the needy. The people of God should cultivate not only their crops, but also the same kind of generous spirit that the Lord has shown them. That concludes our lesson, so let's try to bring all that together. In the conclusion, and we'll call this ignorance and want today. The physical needs of others confront us daily. Applying God's principle for an ancient culture where 98% of people live on farms to our modern culture where only 2% do is a challenge. But common group, but common ground stating starting point is that people of God in all times should live in such a way as to respect the dignity of those in need. Granted, it may take some challenging conversation and creative thinking on our part to apply these principles in specific and helpful ways. This lesson 
scripture text provides principles of justice that each and every follower of God should model and help and act. Ignorance and want continue to manifest themselves today. Unlike Scrooge, we should not rely that injustice be hidden from our eyes. Our Heavenly Father has made it clear that His heart and His compassion are with those in need of yours. That is our lesson today. Um, what the whole purpose of our lesson, or any lesson, as I always state, is to make sure that we give you an opportunity for discipleship. And what we, what we mean by that is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, if, again, your heart is pricked today that you would like to be saved and you want to know how to do that, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to read from you Romans 10, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 from the New International Version. And it says this, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10 says this, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, if you listen to the lesson, and again, your heart is pricked, and you would like to become a member of First Baptist Church of Denby, this is what I suggest. You can call it the Agonet Ministry at 757-234-8971. Or you can call 757-877-1843. And if you want to become a member of First Baptist Denby, you can do so. If you prefer another church, the Diaconate Ministry will direct you also. That concludes our lesson. And let us pray. Lord, I pray that I have done what you require of me. I pray that you will continue to bless America and its people, both black, white, old, and young, and all ethnicities. I pray that you bless our president of these United States of America. I pray that you continue to bless him as he demonstrates his leadership through character, integrity, honesty, knowledge dignity and respect for the American people and the world. I ask these things 